are thrilled to be hosting this briefing today along with the Center for Economic and Social Inclusion in U.S. and in conjunction with the Congressional tri -Caucus. So I really appreciate um, they issued the invitation to Kate Green, our esteemed um, guest here today. And um, so, I, so I appreciate their willingness to sponsor this briefing and for the dedication to the issue of combating child poverty. We want to recognize Kendra Brown of the Congressional Black Caucus for helping to make today happen. Also, a very special thanks to the offices of Congressional um, Danny Davis and Congresswoman Barbara Lee and their staffers, Jill Hunter Williams and Emma, Emma Moravi, for their work on this briefing and the continued leadership on behalf of children in the United States. And to our esteemed guest, um, Kate Green, member of parliament with the Labor Party and Shadow Minister for Women and Inequalities, we are so grateful you could travel with us to be here today. We're looking forward to learning from your experience. Um, so um, let me, I'll, I'll do a really quick bio of her, and then I'm going to do a few slides, and then we'll turn it over to her. She's, the, she's why you're here. Um, so Kate Green is a member of parliament, first elected in uh, May 2010. She's currently shadow minister for women and equalities in the shadow cabinet. Um, previously, she served as shadow minister for disabled people. In that role, she worked to ensure the rights of disabled people and remove the barriers they faced in all aspects of life, from employment to public services. She also served as a shadow junior spokesperson for women and equalities. Um, and then as part of the shadow government, it labor, labor's the opposition, right? So she's part of sort of the labor cabinet. Um, Green's a longstanding campaigner against poverty and equality. Prior to her election to the House of Commons, she was chief executive of the Child Poverty Action Group, a national NGO, which campaigns for the abol abolition of child poverty in the UK and for a better deal for low-income families and children. Before that, between 2000 and 2004, she was director of the National Council for One Parent Families, which is now called Gingerbread. And I could go on and on. She's got a um, very long bio, um, but I, I, think very long. <laughs> <laughs> I think you want to hear from her. So I'll do a talk, talk a little bit about um, Child Poverty Target and some legislation that's in Congress right now. Um, so first of all, um, so I think one thing that I think is really shocking in this country is that child poverty, kids are 64% more likely to live in poverty than, than adults in this country. And so you can see here's, some, here's the last year Census Bureau data on um, where things stand for kids. And so 21% of the nation's kids live in poverty. Um, and you can see, and, and, we, and you all know this very well, which is that it's, it's a very geographically, um, there's, there's concentrations of child poverty. So it's not like it's uniform across the country. So there's very specific issues that we need to address in different parts of the country. But it also speaks to the need for a national, a national involvement because the places where there's high child poverty, there's, there's lower wealth. And therefore, they're not, there's not going to be able to make the investments in kids that that we should make as a nation to address this issue. Um, here's, here's a breakdown um, by race. And the blue bars represent um, kids who live below 100% of poverty, and the red bars are low-income kids, which we define as kids below 200% of poverty. And so you can see, you know, in some, in a lot of cases, we have over three-fifths of kids living below 200% um, of poverty in this country. Um, and we know how to address this. So the, the, the poverty rate for senior citizens in the late, nine, the late 60s when we did our the war on poverty was way higher than that of kids. And so there was a concentration and focus on addressing the poverty rate among senior citizens. And we, we succeeded. We cut it by two-thirds. Meanwhile, we really haven't done what we the, – the opposite has happened for kids because what we had was TAMP, which actually cut the HBC um, entitlement and made it a block grant, and, we, and the value of that uh, has declined dramatically over the period. It's, it's the same amount it was back in 1996. So with inflation, I think the decline is like over a third of the value of TANF is, has uh, dropped. <clears throat> I mean, I would note that, so this, this chart just shows we've made investments, we've made, we made a focus on, on the elderly, and, so that, and that's been a good thing. It's, it's cut poverty rate for seniors, and, and what we are advocating is doing something similar for kids. Right now, the children's budget, that the, the share of spending for kids is now below 8%. Kids are a quarter of the population. So we would argue that um, 
you know, we should be doing a better job there. And the share of spending on kids has declined dramatically in the last five years. Um, so I, I will not go through these, but the difference, the difference between the UK and the US to us is stark. Um, you, at, a, at a point, you've had all the party leaders on both parties, major parties, and actually all three parties, talking about child poverty in one way or the other. And whether, if nothing else, there's a debate that mm -hmm. is happening in, in, in the UK over, over poverty. Um, and, uh, and Kate is going to talk more about this, but they made a, net, a commitment uh, under uh, Prime Minister Blair to cut child poverty. And you can see the UK child poverty rate was way higher than the United States. And then they, they embarked on this mission to cut child poverty or to eradicate it in a generation. And you can see it dropped dramatically. And as Natalie pointed out earlier today, you see the uptick in child poverty in the US during the recession. Look at the difference to what happened in the UK. So they were making investments still and really fighting child poverty when there was a recession. Um, and so it's, it's an offensive weapon to cut child poverty, but it also can be used in a defensive way. And so um, the Tories were talking about eliminating um, the measure completely. They've done some of that. But they were also wanting to get rid of the measures. They didn't even want people to know what the child poverty rate was anymore. And so the, the um, nonprofits in the UK did a great campaign about, you know, if you're trying to make kids invisible, you know, you don't want to know the information. And so they fought back and actually they still must publish the data, nothing else. And so there was a real push and a fight to counter the, the, the government there and, uh, and their efforts to eradicate the measure. So what I want to talk about real quick, and then I'll turn it over, is that <laughs> there's legislation that's been introduced by uh, uh, Congress, Congressman Davis and, and um, co-authored by uh, uh, Congress, Congresswoman Lee, Congressman uh, Connolly and Cummings and nine others. It's H.R. 2408, and the idea is it's, it's very much in line with what the child poverty target was in the, United, in the U.K. Um, since we have a very different form of government, right, it's, we, we try to modify it um, and try to really address, sort of make it a U.S. Um, kind of target. And in the Senate, it's S. 2224, and it's Senators Casey Baldwin and Brown. And then last, um, I, I just want to give a shout out to uh, Congresswoman Lee and Roy Byallard for their efforts. They, in the appropriations bill, they offered an amendment to create a National Academy of Sciences study on child poverty. It's also going to link back to looking at what the UK did and make recommendations to Congress and the White House about things that we can do as a nation to address child poverty. So with that being said, I will turn it over. And I'd like to take the opportunity before Kate speaks to thank Hi, my name is Natalie Bernowski. I'm with Inclusion US. We are a spin off of the Center for Economic and Social Inclusion in London. Uh, I worked for the Blair administration uh, uh, starting in 2000 uh, and worked in the UK for 10 years. But in fact, I'm one of you. Um, so I used to work for Congressman Keith Stark um, from the East San Francisco Bay, worked on welfare reform from 1996. 2000. Um, and so if you'll allow me, I just wanted to say a, a couple of things about, as staff, um, how it might be right to switch on a part of our brains that thinks about how to absorb and transfer what Kate is going to say to our context. The first is that Kate will be talking about our country's population of 60 million people. So you'll want to think about how the policy she's discussing transfer to a country of 320 million people. It is different. Um, so times five. Everything is times five. Um, the next thing is that in the United Kingdom, for the time period that Kate's talking about, policies were relatively centralized, meaning designed and run and implemented very much by Westminster in London. There are four nations in the United Kingdom, England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Our purposes here in the states, I suggest thinking of those four nations as states. So to flip that a bit, we've got 50 nations on one landmass, don't we, here in the United States. If you want to think about how what Kate is saying could be made practical and could be implemented,
think about how often you hear from your governors, from your counties, from your cities. How could a national target actually make sense and dig down deep and be implemented on the ground where it counts? Okay? The third thing to say is, yes, we have different welfare systems, we have different benefit structures, um, we have uh, a different political scene. Um, that's very true, but in order to get the most out of what Kate's going to say, try to transcend that a little bit and think about um, what politics might be like for the next 10 or 15 years. The exciting thing about the target she's going to mention is that it was in place for 14, almost 15 years. So if you can think of a lifetime of a 15-year high-level goal for the country, that's <coughs> That's the kind of um, flavor we want to paint for and, and paint for you today. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to start by seeing if I can find. Yeah, excellent. My own slides. Um, and uh, to say it's great to see so many of you here. Uh, what I'm going to give is a sort of curtailed presentation uh, of what I did earlier this afternoon with advocacy groups. So I will sk skate over some of these uh, present presentation slides very, very quickly so that we can concentrate on what I think you might be interested in, uh, which is which policies worked and how did we do the politics. They're basically the two things I think you would probably want to focus on. So when Labour came into power with a, a landslide victory in May 1997, uh, we had inherited um, a legacy of nearly two decades of conservative right-wing government, which had been very, very bad for children. We had seen the poverty rate, child poverty rate in the UK uh, doubling between 1979 and 1997. Uh, and when we came into office, one in four children uh, were growing up poor. Now, as I'll come on to say, there were a lot of arguments about where did we draw the poverty line. Uh, and that 26% um, figure uh, assumes a, a poverty line favoured by campaigners, so obviously has quite a, um, a, a sort of um, gloomy view of poverty. Uh, but nonetheless, we were much worse on that measure uh, than most of our European peers. Um, and there was, uh, I think, a real impetus in the new Labour government in 1997 uh, to do something about that, which was exemplified by a really remarkable public pledge made by Prime Minister Tony Blair a couple of years after we came into office to say that we would commit to eradicating child poverty uh, within 20 years, within a generation. And there was quite a lot of surprise when he made that, that pledge. Um, quite a lot of surprise that he would say something so bold, because I think at that point, people were very, very unsure that anything like that could be done. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time discussing what we meant by child poverty, although there was a lot of debate in the UK about well, what did we mean, um, did we mean income, did we mean wealth, did we mean um, wider measures of child well-being. Um, you have an accepted definition of poverty. Uh, we too have a series of definitions, which I'll show you in a moment. But the real um, crucial point about the way we chose to measure poverty was to focus on incomes, because most informed opinion thought that that was really crucially related to a range of children's outcomes and they could point to a collateral relationship between income poverty and outcomes along a whole lot of other metrics, health, education, children's well-being. And secondly, we wanted to use relative poverty. Um, really, we understood that poverty in a developed economy like the UK or the US is not the same as growing up poor in, in a developing and very, very impoverished country. Um, so we wanted to use a definition that had been popular for a long, long time, actually, with advocacy groups and academics, uh, to position poverty as being your capacity to function and participate in the society in which you actually live. And that relative poverty definition is also the one that uh, is most frequently used by the OECD in making comparisons across uh, developed economies. So it made a lot of sense for us to focus on that measure. Um, but it was, it was quite a difficult one to sell to the public. And um, <coughs> we really, I think, experienced then and continued to experience all the way through uh, the uh, labor years in power and continue to experience in spades today 
um, a real public scepticism about the whole uh, debate about child poverty. Attitudes that basically said, well, it doesn't exist in rich countries. Um, you only have it in poor countries. Um, people aren't poor. They can eat. They can feed their families. Kids go to school in shoes. We have indoor bathrooms. What's your problem? We don't have it here. Um, or if you do, there's nothing you can do about it. There's a, a long-standing saying in the UK, the poor are always with us. People felt there would always be that poverty, that you could not uh, eliminate it. And that if you uh, wanted to understand why poverty would always continue, it was the fault of individuals and their parents, that the poor were lazy, they were careless, they were feckless, they frittered their money away, they were bad parents. There was a lot of conflating of poverty with poor parenting, not supported by the evidence. Um, so public attitudes, very, very sceptical, um, and yet in the face of that, Labour made a political commitment to do something about child poverty um, and to take it as a, as a major mission for the Blair governments and the, the, the government of Gordon Brown that followed at the tail end of the last uh, decade uh, to take that on. And the reasons we wanted to take it on, you will know all this, because of this correlation between low levels of family income and poor health outcomes for children, poor educational attainment, the fact that poverty has a long-term scarring impact. Poor children grow up often to be poor, out-of-work adults. Um, but we also thought that if the public weren't going to be very interested in that, we should try to make a case about the greater economic and social good. And attempts were made to cost child poverty to the economy, to the UK economy. Uh, the costs in terms of uh, additional health care, um, low productivity, high levels of unemployment, uh, demands on public services. Um, that figure of £29 billion, pounds, which I have to say um, represents a very, very um, contested guess, although a lot of work went into arriving at it, is now nearly 10 years old. So that was the figure that was estimated in about 2007, I think. Um, and of course represents um, a figure for an economy, as Natalie said, of 60 billion people. Um, but it gives you a sense of what the scale of cost to the public purse could be uh, of not addressing poverty. Could I but just do a, a translation, I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt. So 29, 29 billion is about um, 45 billion here. Um, and like Kate said, uh, right, so, and this was for an economy of 60 million people. So I don't know if that, how that feels to you, that number. For us, it felt big. £29 million pounds felt like a big cost to the public purse. Yeah. But actually, although we did that to try to build up a case to the sceptical, the real reason that uh, this was so central to the Labour government programme was that it was a moral uh, issue, particularly for, for Gordon Brown, for many, many years the Chancellor of the Exchequer, um, that he was absolutely committed to putting children first and that um, poverty measures... Uh, were the way to do it. So, determined to do something about it, we first decided that we would set and measure um, targets for progress. I'm not going to go through all the details. There was a lot of discussion then about what those targets should be and how we would calculate poverty. Um, and we came up with four measures, absolute low income, uh, which at the time we thought was a pretty meaningless measure because we really didn't expect things to get worse than they had been 20 years before. The relative poverty measure, which we mostly concentrated on uh, because we thought it was a good measure of how children would thrive and function in the society in which they now live. A, a measure of material deprivation, which we hoped would have some sort of public resonance because that took us its approach, listing um, a, a set of goods and experiences that children, if they lacked them, would be said to be in poverty. And that was some of those things were material. Uh, you couldn't have a winter coat every year. Uh, you couldn't afford um, to heat every room in the house. But some of them were about childhood experiences, the ability to have friends to come round to your house for tea uh, once a fortnight or to go on a family holiday away from home once a, week, once a year. And we hoped that that material deprivation measure would capture the public imagination. It didn't particularly, but it was a very well-intentioned, and I think partly because we didn't really go out there very strongly with it, but it was a well-intentioned attempt to get the public engaged. And then we had a measure of persistent poverty, uh, because actually a very high proportion of children will spend some time in poverty, but the scarring effect of repeated experience of poverty or long-term experience of poverty was particularly damaging. So we got definitions agreed. 
we agreed that we would reduce child poverty over a 20 year time frame uh, to a level of no more than 10 percent so that was that was our definition of elimination uh, but we also felt that a 10 year time frame was a long time frame and we needed to put some interim milestones in along the way and so it was not only decided that child poverty would be reduced to to 10% by 2020, but that by 2010, so halfway to the target, we would have reduced the number of children in poverty by half, and a quarter of the way to the target in 2005, we would have reduced the number of children by a, a quarter, um, so that we had a series of interim staging posts, which became really important uh, to ensure that progress remained on track. And we set about a really comprehensive cocktail policies uh, to try to bear down specifically on the issue of uh, family income poverty but actually with wider reach and impact and the most effective by miles I must say to you was investment in redistributing income to poorer families with children through tax credits two kinds of tax credits one like your EITC which supplemented low wages uh, and which included within it a component to help parents in work with the cost of childcare, the cost of daycare. And a second element of tax credits, which was a means-tested form of support to parents in and out of work for children, for the cost of raising children. And that um, particular form of tax credit, the child tax credit, reached very far up the income scale. This was Gordon Brown's famous progressive universalism. Most families with children got something out of child tax credits and indeed out of working tax credits, but the poorest got the most. That became very important later on uh, when the government tried to attack, the later Conservative government tried to attack some of these tax credits. It proved to be more difficult than they'd expected because quite a lot of families were getting them and two had agreed stood up for them. We also um, had a very big push on maximising parental and particularly lone parent employment. In 1995-6, we had a lone parent employment rate of about 40 percent. Um, we did a number of things including the tax credits, the investment in childcare and labour market programmes to activate lone parents into employment and indeed to impose more conditions and obligations on them to look for work uh, which delivered a very substantial, a 15 percent increase uh, in the proportion of lone parents in employment over the decade. We put in a floor, a minimum wage below which uh, wages could not fall. We never had that before didn't make a huge difference to poverty because as the minimum wage came in, the means-tested benefits through the tax credits were commensurately reduced, but very, very important for maintaining labour market um, dignity, and parents really preferred actually to earn as much of their income as they could rather than to have it through the means of social security support. Stronger rights for parents at work, right to time off for family responsibilities, better maternity, pay and leave, um, major reform, totally unsuccessful, I'm sorry to tell you, of our child support system, our system where, by which separating, separated parents ensure transfer of um, money from the non-resident parent to the parent of care. That got bogged down massively in administrative and IT difficulties um, and really delivered very little, I'm sorry to say. We have a or had until a couple of years ago, a universal payment to all parents uh, for their children. Um, Non-means tested, um, intended to help with the costs of raising children, uh, and we increased that universal benefit substantially while in government. We, as I say, invested in childcare, including not just to help parents work, but for child development reasons. Our Sure Start program, modelled on your Head Start program, uh, very important plank of Labour government policy in terms of long-term investment, a significant investment in our schools and colleges. And we built an infrastructure around all of that. So all of this was happening across government, very much led by our Treasury, um, and therefore sometimes it was quite difficult pull together all the government departments we needed involved. So we eventually established in the um, government, in government, a child poverty unit, a cross-government unit, um, and an external commission to advise on policy. Um, for was our, very successful. For our understanding, the child poverty unit, um, as Kate said, was run by the Department for uh, Helping Aid Children and Families. Children, schools, and families. Children, schools, and families, which eventually became the Department of Education. Uh, the Department for Work and Pensions, and Her Majesty's Treasury. So the Child Poverty Unit was very much run by civil servants. A little bit of a different structure from here, as you know, our political appointees um, infiltrate quite far down into the civil service structure. 
uh, not the case here. So there, there, there were no political appointees within child poverty units. So it truly was an independent government unit that gave non-political advice, carried out research uh, on all of the child poverty related uh, policies. What you might notice we didn't do at that stage, we did it very much later, just before Labour left office in 2010, was actually legislate for child poverty targets. That came at the very end of the Labour um, government. Um, but we had the infrastructure ready with the targets, the measures, and the child poverty unit when the legislation came. What happened? Well, Bruce has already told you our policies were successful. We saw a very um, significant reduction in um, absolute low income, as you can see, but also more pleasingly for us in relative low income, in relative uh, poverty. Um, not in every year, in one or two years it went up slightly, um, which proved to us very clearly as advocacy groups that if you didn't do the policy, you didn't get the benefit. You had to keep on with the investment if you wanted to continue to prove, bring poverty down. But we could point very clearly to the efficacy of that cocktail of policy measures in actually reducing relative income poverty. And we continued with that investment in the aftermath of the uh, global financial crash, which is why child poverty continued to reduce, as Natalie was pointing out, during uh, the recession years in the UK. Um, which were the same as here. We're yeah, talking two, yeah. No, we're talking 2008. Same time. Yeah, it was your crash. We had passed was our crash. <laughs> your crash. We, you infected <laughs> us. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. But you know, two, if you can, 2007, 2008, 2009, look, look at the trend. You're still making still flat back. on some measures, but on the whole, still declining. Yeah. So this is this is what a target can help make happen. Yeah. And actually, um, that was a very deliberate policy of the Labour government in the aftermath of the crash to, to protect families and children, partly to protect families and children, but partly to keep money in the economy. Right. Um, because we, we were very much in the mode of stimulus as a means of getting out of recession. Uh, and one very easy way to get money into the economy very quickly was to give it to mothers because they'd go out and spend it on their kids. And we knew that. We absolutely knew to give money to mums. That was what we did. So it was it was not just about continuing our child poverty strategy uh, in the aftermath of the crash. It was also part of our fiscal response to the crash, uh, our fiscal stimulus, and, and uh, continued to work protectively for quite some time. So that was all great. Um, we were not quite as good as we'd hoped to be. We didn't meet the target of half child poverty by 2010, but the trends were good. Uh, we had proved that the policies worked, and in the years when you didn't do them, you had to, you would get um, a rise in poverty. So there was a real obvious message to government: keep doing what you're doing. It makes a difference. Um, and uh, we were significantly improved in the European League table, actually, by the end of the um, first decade of the millennium. Um, we'd gone from being um, something like 21st out of 22 or something. Yeah. Um, down to being in the um, about 12. a third of the way off the table. We were a long way improved. Partly that's because some other countries came into the table who were very poor, but partly it was just our improvement. Then we lost office in 2010 and a coalition, Conservative-led coalition government came into office. And the first thing that they were very clear about was that they didn't buy into this argument that poverty was about relative income. They didn't believe it was about money and they didn't believe it was about a relative poverty line because they believed that that led us to concentrate on just lifting people a pound above the poverty line um, and then not doing anything more. It wasn't true, in fact. Incomes had risen in every income decile under Labour, not just uh, of those families around the poverty line, but it became um, a popular slogan with them that Labour's policy was all about poverty plus a pound and that really wasn't good enough. They wanted, therefore, to abandon the targets and the definition and began a consultation on that and while they were busy talking about all of that, we as campaigners, I was in Parliament by this time, but still campaigning pretty actively, uh, we had um, really shifted the focus of our attention from out of work poverty to the shocking rise in the number of families with a member of the household in paid employment where children were growing up in poverty. Two thirds of our poor children are in families where at least one member of the household is in paid work. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, shocking. I mean, I think that is the most shocking indictment of what, where we are now. Um, then the Conservatives had a number of policies that they introduced um, to try to um, improve the lot of low-income families and children within their own ideology. The most significant, but it hasn't yet really affected these families because so far um, it's way behind schedule, way over budget and very, very technical, is the universal credit, which sought to bring all the payments for parents and children, or pretty well all the payments, into a single um, monthly benefit, a benefit that would be paid to one member of the household every four weeks. It's been 
beset with problems, universal credit, both administrative problems, um, design problems, and the fact that um, the value of it has been eroded significantly as part of our Chancellor's um, cuts approach to public spending, significant spending cuts. Alongside that came much more severe obligations on, on uh, parents to look for and take up work, the capping and freezing of the value of benefits. The minimum wage was increased to what the Chancellor called a living wage. It wasn't actually a living wage, but it was a significant uplift in the minimum wage, or will be, comes in next month. Um, of course, as soon as that happens, the benefits spend is clawed back, so families aren't left better off, but the heel good about it. Continuing expansion of childcare and parental rights under the Conservatives, um, and a very good policy from the Liberal Democrat uh, part of the coalition, the pupil premium, which directed additional resources to schools with high levels of deprivation uh, on their school rolls. Um, however, that was unfortunately accompanied by cuts to other schools' budgets, which meant the pupil premium hasn't really delivered all that um, I think it could. The Conservatives won again a majority government last May and have proceeded down an even more aggressive form of that agenda. Um, most particularly, as we've said, getting rid of the targets to eradicate child poverty um, altogether and instead setting new measures of worklessness, pretty pointless when the problem is actually this two thirds of children in working households who are poor, um, and educational attainment, which is important, but they are measuring it when the child turns 16, which is far, far too late to do anything to rectify the disadvantage that poor kids experience in the education system. Um, as Bruce showed you, there was a vote in the House of Lords recently which forced them to concede on continuing to publish the data on our poverty measures, the labour poverty measures, uh, but they've abandoned any targets to achieve particular levels of poverty and they've significantly watered down the independent commission that Labour set up to. So, as a consequence of their policies, um, having seen one million children lifted out of poverty under Labour's administration, the government in 2011 first predicted that a further 350,000 children would come out of poverty by 2020 as a result of their universal credit and work incentives. Then they downgraded that to 150,000 more children would come out of poverty by 2020 um, because universal credit was delayed and a few other things were going on. Now the Independent Institute for Fiscal Studies say that far from reducing, child poverty will increase from 3.6 million to 4.3 million children by 2020. In other words, we will be right back where we started when Labour came into power uh, in 1997 um, with a, uh, that, um, um, an increased child poverty rate. So the conclusions I would draw for you are that the targets worked, um, you know, they set a direction of travel, they forced policy to um, be developed and implemented to achieve those targets until the Conservatives came in. <laughs> Um, poverty is highly contested, definitions, what is it, the public are very sceptical, um, but that doesn't actually prevent you from making progress. Um, as you know, um, outcomes for children are at the heart of why you would want to reduce child poverty, but the problem is that you may not see the impact for many years. Um, what we do know, however, is that paid work is certainly not a sufficient answer. It has to be decently paid work that parents can, can do and afford to keep their families. However, in general, the message from the Blair years, the Labour years, is that policy works. You can reduce child poverty, we did reduce child poverty. The key messages, I would say, are an ambition, a quantified ambition, a measured ambition, and a set of policies which you implement and immediately react and adjust if they're not proving uh, to take you to the destination you want to reach are essential. And for us, those policies fundamentally were about redistribution of income to low-income families, particularly through the mechanism of tax credits and through boosting parental employment. So thank you very much, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion.
think um, something I would want to emphasize is that there was a child poverty target that sat alongside a full employment target in the United Kingdom, full employment being at 80%. Um, that's not saying that we're trying to get all of that done here today, um, but uh, the state of the economy did help with the target as well. Um, and another thing that I'd like to emphasize is that something Kate said uh, when we were at First Focus earlier today, is that if you don't set a target, it won't get met. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this really is about putting some kind of measurable, long-term goal in place. Um, I wanted to mention a, a few of the, before we start the discussion, we had a few recommendations in a report that we did along with First Focus. We looked at the 14-year span of the child poverty target. We looked in depth at the policies that were designed and delivered under the Labor government. And we also looked at those uh, policies and how they were changed and tweaked uh, under uh, first the coalition government and then the conservative government. So just a couple of things here. Um, the first is that um, we recommend that a national child poverty target and a timeline um, be, be the essential components of a national strategy. So the target has to be put in place. Um, now in the United Kingdom, the target was to eradicate poverty. There are nuances to that. Um, and I have to say, uh, you know, uh, out of the four nations, um, I believe it was Scotland, um, was the only one of the four that actually met the first uh, quarterly target. So. By 2005, I think I have this right, Scotland had reduced child poverty by 25%. Um, if, you, if you look at this longer term, uh, it really did depend on what newspaper you read. So if you were reading a newspaper that said, oh, okay, well, the Labor government has put in place a national child poverty target, and it's only reduced child, and it has reduced child poverty by 18%, wow, how about that? Can you imagine reducing child poverty by 18% in a five-year period in the United States? I, you know, the United Kingdom is the only industrialized country that actually got it done. If you were reading another kind of newspaper, you would say, oh, this national child poverty target has set us up for failure. We've tried to reduce it by 25% in the first quarter, and or in the first five years, and we only made it to 18%. My point there is that it has to be aspirational. Or you don't, or you don't even make a change. So this language of eradicating child poverty over a, a timed period uh, is really important. Our second recommendation is um, I wanted to emphasize the independent analytical unit that actually manages the target, manages the research, uh, develops the policy recommendations to members of Parliament of both parties. Um, I will say actually. Uh, uh, Kate has long been part of the all-party parliamentary group on poverty. Just think of that phrase. There is a bipartisan group of members of parliament who work on this issue. Um, so the child poverty unit is responsible for evaluating policies um, and, and really uh, scanning them and uh, making recommendations for the potential effectiveness over the duration of the target. Um, we also believe that the, the child poverty target should link with employment and broader economic policy. Um, as I said, we were talking here about um, the impact of poverty, the, the estimated impact of poverty on a country of 50 million people. Um, the narrative in the United Kingdom, both by Prime Minister Blair and, and latterly by Prime Minister Gordon Brown, was that a child poverty target wasn't just about outcomes, for children, it was about the strength of the economy. If we're talking about a 20 year stretch, we are talking about children that are then going to be part of the workforce. We are talking about children who are then going to have to rely in, in some way as adults on the health system. Uh, and, and what does that mean over a period of time in terms of, of expense and, and the strength of, of workers and participants in their economy? We made a recommendation of a, com a combination of both short and long-term policies, and this really is an attempt at being bipartisan. So 
So this is going to be very simplistic, but um, if you looked at labor policy, um, one could say that there was an emphasis on um, benefits, um, improving family income, tax credits, um, and, and really infusing the economy with that spend uh, and getting that spend into, into households. The conservative approach was more about, as Kate said, um, was, was more about uh, long-term educational outcomes um, and, and took a longer view, which in our opinion uh, is much harder to measure, takes much more time. But if we want to try to do something in a bipartisan way, we think there has to be some kind of mixture of short-term policy and long-term policy. So perhaps think about that. Um, you want, to you want to choose the policies that have a proven impact. We have those here in the United States. We know tax credits work. Um, we know Head Start and that structure um, has an impact on poverty. Um, you all know of the most popular uh, poverty reduction policies in your state and the ones that your boss has championed. And we've, we've heard very much from Kate that it's about um, the equivalent of our I VIPC. Um, uh, investments in child care, major investments in child care, um, both in terms of cost and quality and early childhood education. We've got evidence to prove that those things work in the United Kingdom. We know that they work here as well. Um, and of course, because we're working in a federal system that has to consider states and local governments, we recommend a comprehensive and cooperative federal, state, and local partnership to get this done. I can remember, you know, from my days here on the Hill, that in some ways you really do have to factor in your mayors and your counties. Um, so that sort of concludes our recommendations, and uh, I hope that will help to set the context for some good questions for you. Yeah, so um, any questions? policies work, we're following that two track agenda. So our employment policies, for example, um, were directed at mothers, particularly lone mothers, um, and parental, maximizing parental um, economic um, performance in the workplace. Um, and we um, were also um, focusing on maternal well-being, for example, some of our policies with our healthcare policies, and the way in which we made our maternity benefits more generous. Uh, we're, we're focused on the parents, but obviously um, we had a, a very clear analysis that poor mothers have poor kids and rich mothers have better off kids, and that if you address um, maternal poverty, you actually are addressing child poverty. But some of our measures were very specifically child well-being measures. Um, the Sure Start program was all about child well-being and child development, early years, good quality early years provision, uh, with a view to the long-term outcomes for those children. Um, I think our overall view was, though, that we knew that if you put money into the hands of mothers, or the main cares of children, but usually that was the mother, um, they would spend that money in an intelligent way for the benefit of their families. And we'd had plenty of years of analysis to tell us that, and, and it proved to be absolutely correct when we, we checked it out. We did some, uh, the Policy Studies Institute in the UK did a big research programme to see what all this money was actually spent on. They discovered it was spent on improving children's diets, um, buying educational and uh, other sort of developmental toys and paying off family debts, all to the benefit of kids. So I don't think we saw a dichotomy. I think we saw it all as part of a, a combined policy approach that looked at mothers and at children and at fathers. Fathers became quite important um, in a number of ways. Uh, there, was a, there was quite a lot of anxiety going on about the family and about parenting and family stability, largely coming from the Conservatives, actually, but it was a very legitimate... A set of questions to raise. Um, so there was quite a lot of attention being paid to family policy, um, and a family policy unit, in fact, was established when I was um, a civil servant in the immediate aftermath of the 97 election, which um, I think, um, in some form or other, has continued all the way through. Sure. 
maternity leave at, the, at and the, around the time of birth and after the birth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, a lot of the maternity legislation that we have in the UK is actually based on European Union legislation, which is one reason why we're so anxious that we might leave the European Union uh, <laughs> later on. Because there are other reasons to be anxious as well, but that's one. That it has actually been the source of a lot of our workplace rights, uh, and maternity is a very particular example of that. Um, and there's plenty of evidence, obviously, about the benefits of um, family leave for um, child, you know, for settling the child development of the child, and mother's health and well-being, um, and also about well-designed maternity leave, ensuring that the mother remains and continues to have an attachment to the labour market. So quite a lot of our maternity legislation is about your your right to return to your job after a period of maternity break, um, either the job you left or a job. <laughs> equivalent to it. Um, and we have seen significant increases in the proportion of mothers in work after birth, returning to work after they've given birth. The move now has kind of shifted on to the point I was saying um, a moment ago about the role of fathers, to sharing that leave between fathers and mothers. And that is quite a tricky policy area. It's not really delivering, I would say, because the government is very reluctant to replace to, to pay fathers paternity leave at a replacement rate for the loss of the income that they will suffer while they're not in employment. Um, because that would be costly, men earn more than women. So they want to share the maternity leave between women and men. And there are various things that are wrong with that. The first is that actually that means a woman will take it because you know that's just what happens. Um, secondly, after the first um, 12 weeks, the payment is significantly less generous. It's um, 100 and something pound a week. It doesn't come close to replacing typical male earnings. Uh, and thirdly, there's just a culture of, this, of not facility, but culturally, employers and individuals don't really get the idea that men should take six months off. Right. It's just not how they think. So the, that hasn't really come through. Just, and I have to say, you know, the present government has been trying to do that. This is conservative policy. Um, and I just think if they're serious about it, and I'm not against it, I mean, I think the quality of paternity leave would be excellent, um, they need to be prepared to spend some money on it, and up till now they haven't. Um, but maternal, maternity leave has been very uncontested politically, actually. We've moved a long way over the last couple of decades in the UK from employers saying that it was going to be massively inconvenient and, and costly to them. It isn't actually costly because they get it reimbursed by the, the public purse. Right. Um, and then some if they're a small business. Um, and it is inconvenient. I think most employers would acknowledge that. But I think most employers now would accept and accept, expect that it's just part of doing business. If you've got mothers in your workplace, they've got to be able to take the journey to leave and return to work. Although there are some shocking examples of that not happening, and women now being unable to challenge those practices because we've introduced new fees to go to an employment tribunal. And just to give you an idea, this, um, do I remember that it's 12 months? Oh, is it it's two years. You can have up to two years, but um, there's a paid element of 12 weeks. Well, it paid at 90% of your salary for 12 weeks. Then it goes down to 100 and something pounds. Right. And then there, you can per week. Come on. Yeah, a week. And then you can. $150. And then you can continue until two years after that. <coughs> and then you guarantee the return to your previous employment. Yeah. But it won't all be paid all the way After another period, I think it's still being paid all together. Yeah. I think the second year you're going to pay all. Okay. And you said the business gets paid? Yeah. yeah. So if the, bus the business has. So yeah. it, it yeah. doesn't cost the business anything. They don't. Uh, your salary while you're on maternity leave, the business will be reimbursed for. And small businesses will be reimbursed to something like 107 percent of the cost to cover the extra administrative costs that they bear as well. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Reed, Reed McIntosh, Labor Coalition. Uh, here in the U.S., we have a subgroup of child farm workers, um, children from migrant farm worker families, and they are extremely impoverished. And this is something that First Focus has been working very hard to address. I was wondering if in the UK did you face special populations that where poverty is really intransigent? Yeah. They're often very small groups, so it's quite easy to lose sight of them in the big picture. But we have some vulnerable groups that are very, very vulnerable to poverty. Um, the groups would include disabled children or children of disabled parents. Uh, very, very high levels of poverty in those families, masked by the way we measure poverty, which is to look at income but not costs. And they get extra disability benefits, so they look better off than they are. Um, we have um, a very, um, and that's not a small group of children, that's a large group of very vulnerable children. Um, secondly, children growing up in larger families, three or more kids in the household, 
uh, will significantly increase levels of poverty. Uh, it's therefore highly regrettable that the Conservative government has just cut benefits for larger families, which will be extremely damaging to those households. Uh, small numbers of kid families with large numbers of kids are really small numbers when you get to five, six, and seven kids. But the, the Conservatives like to portray this as, you know, effective parenting, people keep on having kids they can't afford to have, um, and cracking down on that. Certain ethnic groups very, very vulnerable to poverty. Um, for example, um, some of our South Asian communities, um, some of our um, African Caribbean communities, very, very, um, particularly African communities actually now. Um, and very interestingly, you've got very high levels of employment in the African Caribbean community, particularly maternal employment. Uh, but because of you know, the gender pay gap, which is still around 20% in the UK, um, most families don't escape poverty. And then you've got some very, very small groups of children who are very, very vulnerable to poverty. So we have still a gypsy and traveller community who are massively vulnerable on every measure of child well-being, actually, education, health, family, poverty. Um, and then you've got a very interesting dynamic. You know, Bruce showed you your map of where is poverty in your country. And poverty in our country, there's a lot of it in our inner cities, our big inner cities, as you'd expect. But rural poverty, small numbers of children, but very, very um, uh, significant levels of poverty because of lack of employment, basically, in those communities. So we published, when I was at Child Poverty Action Group, we published um, a book called At Greatest Risk, The Children Most Likely to Be Poor. And that had about 12 chapters covering different, 12 different groups who were really vulnerable to poverty. And we used to say, if you dealt with every one of those groups, you would actually have resolved the problem. <laughs> so all you needed was to set policies to meet each of those situations, and then you'd be there. <laughs> Emphasize to um, just something that we discussed uh, in our last meeting. Uh, of course, here in the United States, the issue of diversity. Um, I think we're nearly at about 35% of the U.S. population is non-white. In the United Kingdom, it's a bit of a different pr picture. So, uh, not quite 15% of the population is non-white. So, you actually see a very high incidence of poverty amongst the white working class in these kind of industrialized cities, Manchester, Liverpool, um, where, where industry and manufacturing jobs have really declined. So it's something to think about. And I would add that a majority of kids below the age of five are majority minority now yes. in the United States. Yes. Yeah, well, we're heading, our, our demographic is such that it we, is will, we will get much more likely within the next 20 years. Yes. <laughs> Hello, good afternoon, Kate. My name is Crystal. I'm with the American Academy of Pediatrics. I'm a resident and the Academy released, it released its first uh, poverty statement last week. I'm really focusing on outcomes, as you highlighted there, um, for children that are affected by childhood poverty. So I'd be interested to hear more about perhaps some of the metrics that were measured over the decline in the poverty rate, perhaps like uh, achievement rates in reading and math or obesity rates, uh, access to care, vaccination rates, if those were measured a long time, if there were any correlations that were observed. I mean, I think I might have to come back to you. I was asked a similar question earlier on this afternoon, and I haven't got all that data sort of front of mind, I'm afraid. Um, when we were first in government after the 97 election, we did for a while produce a series of metrics, um, about 25 or 30 indicators, under the branding of Opportunity for All, not just about children, actually. We looked at um, outcomes for um, all sorts of groups in the population. And that looked at things like health outcomes, educational attainment, mental well-being, self-esteem, teenage pregnancy, housing, um, labour market participation, risky behaviour by young people, you know, um, propensity to uh, substance misuse or, or violence and crime. Um, and after a few years, I thought it was really good, actually. I, it was a really yes. useful document, and it came out every year. Uh, the government abandoned it, and I don't know why, because actually it wasn't a particularly bad news story for them. It was showing that they were beginning to make a difference. Um, and I think it would have been a really good repost, actually, to the Conservative government saying Labour was only interested in money. Because if we carried on doing that, we would have had a good story to tell down a whole lot of different metrics. So I think one lesson I would say is incomes are really important, and you can really focus around an income target. Um, and you can really drive all those other outcomes off the back of an income target. But you must talk about those other outcomes, because that's where you can make the results feel real and lived. And and actually convincing to people. Um, and um, it will also lead you to think about policies beyond just the income measures that you will need to take. Um, a lot of the policies that we were introducing, I think, will be, would take time to show their effect. 
Um, you know, some of them were intergenerational. Do this today for children so that they'll grow up to be adults tomorrow with much better outcomes than their parents' generation. And we haven't yet seen that effect work its way through. And of course, what we've then had is pretty abrupt change in direction. Um, so one of the things that academics are very, very interested in in the UK is comparing cohorts of children. Um, and we have studies that are comparing different generations of children going back to the 1940s and 50s. And it will be very, very interesting, although we'll have to wait for more 20 or 30 years to see this, to see what happens to the children of the Labour years and what happens to the children of the Conservative years that came afterwards. Because if you look at the history of previous generations, children born in the 40s and 50s saw significant economic and social improvement. Children born under the Thatcher years in the um, 80s, uh, the outcomes for them as adults have been very, very much poorer. I'm Heather Hahn from the Urban Institute, which is a nonpartisan research oh, organization. I don't know that. I must have met some of you people in London, I think. <laughs> uh, and so you started to talk about some of the research that has been really useful in um, supporting the policies and thinking about what works and what doesn't. And so I'm wondering if you could highlight, um, to the extent that you haven't yet, what research was particularly useful, as well as what research you don't have but would be useful. Yeah. Very useful. Um, so there's a lot of national data sets that you can just access off the government statistical websites. Um, the, the targets are, are all public Office for National Statistics data. Um, and um, we have a, a, you know, a big academic community around poverty in the UK researching anything that uh, they can you know, get funded for to go off and have a look at. Um, and almost all of it is useful. I've seen very little research actually that hasn't been useful. Um, in looking at what works and um, for which children it works and where it doesn't work, why not? That's, we've got a rich research base, I think I would say, in the UK um, around what happened in the Blair years, um, particularly through um, an organisation called the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, who kind of helped to draw a lot of that together and have been very, very influential in shaping the research agenda and funding really top quality, pretty incontrovertible incontro research, actually. Um, I think my frustration with research is not what would I like that it doesn't give me, but why does it take so long? <laughs> so I would like to, I can tell you now, I can absolutely tell you, because I've spent years looking at this, that we are going to see more poor children in 2020. But really frustratingly for Labour, I mean, it looks like children are not getting poorer, because that isn't happening yet, or showing up in the data yet. Um, and after 2010, the protective effect of the measures that our Labour governments have put in place to cope with the aftermath of the recession continue to protect children through the early years of the Conservative administration. Yes. And it's only now we're beginning to see the data that will show, will show yeah. that that's beginning to turn up the other way. So my frustration is not so much what do we not know as why can't we know it sooner. And sometimes we can't because it is about long-term outcomes, but sometimes I just think, it would be really nice to prove this a bit faster yes. than we seem to be able to. I would add to that by saying um, um, the report that is in the packet really does look at every piece of research we've been getting our hands on for the past 14 years. And that can be a little tricky. If you can imagine trying to go to an HHS website to try to, pol try to find a policy and evaluation from 2001. You know, just, just try to imagine that. So we've collected absolutely everything we can. There's a good deal of Joseph Roundtree Foundation we can't say that there is absolutely one policy that is responsible for a decline in child poverty in the United Kingdom. But what we can say with confidence, which we said in the report, is that the period of greatest decline of child poverty coincides with the implementation of tax credits, in work tax credits, major investments in child care, availability and quality, and, and financing. Uh, and investment in early childhood education. Those really are the, the top three, I would say. Oh, added to all of the other things, uh, uh, increased national minimum wage, there's a lot in there, but if we had to choose three, um, that had the greatest impact during that time, that's what we would say. I would add, and I would add the, the family matters, what are kinds of cases that we're All of those things which contribute to job quality. Because yes. I mean, if you look at child poverty, for, for young kids below the age of you know, five, 
but child poverty rates much even higher. And so, and, and Senator Warren um, worked on a paper before she became senator, obviously. She found that 7% um, of all bankruptcies in the country happen in families in the first year of life of a child. And so it makes sense if you think about it because that's exactly, you know, people going out of the workforce, they're having a new expense of a child, all those kinds of things. So they're having increased costs, less um, funding. And so if there's anything then that happens, like the child's sick or, you know, you know, you've already have one person leaving leaving the workforce, and we have terrible family medical leave in this cause in this country. Um, you can see why that would be the case. And so, I think that that would be another piece to answer here. Like, it would be great to have that updated and have it sort of specifically looked at in terms of bankruptcy filings and the impact on kids. So, I think we have time for one more question, and then um, if anyone has any more questions, if not. I just want to highlight again um, the, the Child Poverty Reduction Act, which is H.R. 2408. Um, and then also in, it's in the Senate, it's S2224. And there's over 250 groups across the country who are supported. If you guys have any questions, please contact us at First Focus or any of the people who have signed on to the legislation. We're happy to give you information about it or answer any questions. Um, with that, oh, we're, can oh, I just, sure. Is there a yes. way, like, how do we tap into your expertise once you leave? Because staff are in the throes of appropriations requests, blah, blah, but in the we fall. We got it in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I was trying to figure out, is there, like, is it through you, Natalie? Uh, are you? I would say, I would say there, us? yeah, I would say. Yeah. We, we're, we're happy we're, to. We're in contact. I would also have, there are a couple of UK NGOs that are really worth looking at. I mean, Joseph Bernardine Foundation on their website have a massive information. Uh, about different aspects of childhood and uh, <coughs> poverty generally. The Child Poverty Action Group, which I used to uh, work at, again, very, very rich source of data and expertise. Um, I'm certain if I'm kind of asking a question, those are the two websites I would have a look at first. Um, if you're interested in the effect of fiscal measures in the for fiscal studies. Thank you all for coming today. I know it's late in the day. And, um, and I know there's a lot of crazy stuff going on on the Hill. Some, a lot of it bad for kids. <laughs> uh, so I appreciate you all fighting a good fight. Uh, but thank you for coming in. And um, give us a call if we could be of any help. Thank you. We're up here. Thank you. Thank you.